In the summer of 1993, the Phillies seemed invincible. But all of that came to a screeching halt one night in October. And no, I'm not talking about the infamous home run that no Philly fan should be forced to rewatch. The fact is, Joe Carter's walk-off home run was a foregone conclusion, a moment sealed by fate by events that unfolded just days before. It was October 20th, 1993. The Phillies appeared to have game four sewn up with a five-run lead going into the late innings. A Phillies win would have tied up the series at two, with one game left in Philadelphia and potentially two more in Toronto. But in the top of the eighth inning, all hell broke loose, robbing Phillies fans of much of their hope of capping off what had been an incredible season with what would have been the franchise's second World Series win in its 110-year history. Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball History. Don't forget to check out our merchandise. T-shirts, phone cases, masks, notebooks, mugs, and much more. Just go to tpublic.com and look for Philadelphia baseball history. Called up the homies and I'm maxing y'all. Which part are y'all playing basketball? Philly's fever swept through the Delaware Valley in the summer of 1993. That season, Philly's fans felt a whole panoply of emotions, from pleasantly surprised to deeply euphoric to nervous anxiety to bitter anger and then finally to resigned acceptance. Our Phillies came out of the starting box at full throttle, and they just wouldn't let up. We all knew that they were playing above their heads. Heck, the year before, the Phillies had finished in last place in the National League East, so we expected that at some point, they'd come crashing down to earth. But during the regular season, that didn't happen. In fact, it seemed like they were finding ways to win games they had no business winning. Maybe it was the extra inning heroics in the third game of the season to sweep the opening series in Houston. Warren Dini scores. Crook is coming around. The ball gets through. Dalton's going to be able to score two. Maybe it was the extra inning Dave Holland's home run in Chicago after the Phils had blown the lead in the bottom of the ninth. Oh, out of here. Home run, Dave or maybe it was the Mariano Duncan grand slam in the bottom of the eighth against Lee Smith and the Cardinals on May 9th that put the game away after the Phils had been down by three. Or maybe it was the way that the Phillies could come from behind to score five runs in the seventh and put away the Mets in a seven to six victory. The thing was, we just believed they could win that season, even if they were behind in the late innings. Harry Callas had a number of nicknames for this team, from the Cardiac Kids to the team of blue collar throwback players. And everybody in and around the city was excited about the Phillies that summer. Even Pierre Robert, a local radio DJ with a midday show, who was not known for being a sports fan, put on a segment where he taught those who were members of the audience who weren't so sports oriented how to fake it. If somebody starts a conversation with, hey, how about them fills? Aren't they something this year? Robert taught his listeners that the proper response was, yeah, if the bullpen holds up, even if you had no idea what a bullpen was. And the anchor of the Phillies' bullpen was Mitch Williams. Williams was nicknamed the Wild Thing because basically he had two pitches, a blazing fastball right down the middle and duck. The fact is with a fastball in the high 90s, but with a lack of control, when Williams came in to close a game, batters were reluctant to dig in. In April of 1991, 
the Phillies acquired the Wild Thing from the Cubs in exchange for pitchers Chuck McElroy and Bob Scanlon. Williams was a former All-Star and even came in the top 10 in the National League Cy Young voting in 1989. But his lack of control meant that he had a high walks per nine innings ratio. You gotta worry about wild pitches. It was 6.8 in 1990. Boy, if you got a weak heart. Even if his strikeouts per nine innings was a healthy 7.5. Yet, Williams was able to keep his ERA relatively low. Thus, even though he had a tendency to walk many batters, he seemed to find a way to get the outs that he needed to earn the save. As Williams racked up 30 saves in 1991, then 29 in 1992, and finally 43 saves in 1993, Phillies fans got used to watching the ninth inning with their collective hearts in their throats as Williams allowed the base runners. But then the feeling of great relief when the final batter struck out. Meanwhile, many of the Phillies regulars seemed to have the best seasons of their careers in 1993. The core Phillies players like John Kruk Darren Dalton, Lenny Dykstra, and Dave Hollins, they were in their prime, and they were posting some of the best numbers in their careers. Jim Fergosi demonstrated amazing skill in managing the outfield, creating platoons to take advantage of the different pitching combinations that the Phillies faced. Milt Thompson handled the righties, while Pete Incavilia who posted the best batting average of his career, faced off mostly against lefties. Likewise, Jim Eisenreich hit over 300, facing mostly righties. Two pitch, fastball, high jack, base hit, right field. Coming in to score for a TD. The Bills have come all the way back, and this game is tied at 8-8. While Wes Chamberlain, hit a healthy 282, facing mostly lefties. The team's biggest hole, shortstop, seemed to be filled when rookie Kevin Stocker appeared on the scene, making his debut on July 7th and batting 324 for the rest of the season. Pitching-wise, Kurt Schilling and Tommy Green both won 16 games, while Terry Mulholland led the team with an ERA of 3.25. After a fast start, the Phillies found themselves with a record of 52 wins and 25 losses at the end of June. Good enough for a six and a half game lead over their division rivals, the Cardinals. But they lost some steam in July going 14 and 14 that month. Still, no team in the East challenged them as the Phils maintained a six game lead in the standings. They increased that to a nine game lead over Montreal after regaining their winning edge in August and would eventually clinch the division with five games to go in September. But as good as the Phillies were, there were two teams in the National League that were better. While the Phillies were having a relatively easy time with the National League East, the Braves and the Giants were engaged in an epic battle in the National League West. A battle that went down to the last day, as Atlanta edged out San Francisco by one game. Because baseball's playoff system at the time only pitted the two division winners against each other, the team with the second best record in the National League was forced to sit the playoffs out. Going into the 1993 NLCS, the Phillies were the clear underdogs. 
the Braves with their 104 victories were in their third year of a 14-season run at winning their division. Indeed, after the Phillies eked out an extra inning win in Game 1, the Braves' powerful offense blew the Phillies out in Games 2 and 3. But the team that somehow found a way to win all season it did exactly that in the first round of the playoffs. The Phillies edged out the Braves in two one-run affairs, including an extra inning affair that involved late inning heroics by Lenny Dykstra. And that was all that the Phillies needed to wake up their bats as they wrapped up the series in a 6-3 contest in Game 6. But those watching the 1993 NLCS closely could see the impending downfall. The MVP of the series was Curt Schilling, who mowed down the powerful Braves lineup. Over the course of 16 innings, Schilling had given up a total of three earned runs while striking out 19. In his two outings, Schilling went eight innings both times, and both times he handed off a lead to the bullpen. Yet Schilling won the MVP award in spite of the fact that he didn't earn a single win in the series. Rather, in Game 1, after the Wild Thing made his appearance, a walk and a Kim Batiste error in the ninth allowed the Braves to tie up the ballgame. Williams further gave up a single and a double in the tenth, but miraculously got out of the inning without giving up a run, thus setting up Kim Batiste's redeeming walk-off RBI in the bottom of the 10th. In Game 5, Schilling had shut the Braves out through eight and two-thirds inning, handing off a three-run lead to Williams with two men on base. Williams promptly gave up three runs, one of which was charged to Schilling. After Dykstra's home run, it was left to Larry Anderson who retired the Braves in order in the bottom of the 10th. As Schilling could be seen in the dugout with a towel over his head, so he wouldn't have to watch as his pitching marvel became unraveled, he embodied the emotion of all Phillies fans whenever Mitch Williams came into a game in a safe situation. The Wild Thing, who had made a career out of overpowering tired batters in the late innings, was running out of gas. Which brings us to October 20th, 1993. At the time, the Phillies were down two games to one against the Blue Jays in the World Series. But that series was hardly out of reach. Playing in Philadelphia, a win would have tied up the series and given the Phillies a fighting chance with three games to go. But the game began under auspicious circumstances. Tommy Green gave up seven runs and didn't even make it out of the third inning. Yet, the Phillies batters were giving as good as they got. Teeing off against Todd Stottlemyre, the Phillies scored four runs in the first to take the lead, and then forced Stottlemyre out of the game after two innings. After tying the game in the fourth, the Phillies seemed to be in the driver's seat, scoring five runs off Al Leiter in the fifth. And while David West gave up two in the top of the sixth, the Phillies got one back in the bottom of the sixth. When Tony Castillo loaded the bases and then forced in a run by hitting Darren Dalton, the Phillies regained a five-run lead after seven innings. But there were two innings left. In the eighth, Larry Anderson failed to nail things down as he gave up a run and left two men on after one out for Mitch Williams, who was coming in for a five-out save. But Williams immediately gave up an RBI hit to Tony Fernandez, a run that was charged to Anderson. 
Williams continued by giving up a walk before getting a strikeout, only to give up a two-run single to Ricky Henderson. That was followed up by a two-run triple by Devon White. So while two runs were technically charged to Larry Anderson, five runs had been scored after Williams came into the game. Five runs and the lead, as the Phillies were now down by one. For the last six outs, the Phillies batters could not regain their footing, as they were retired in order for two innings in a row. When the dust had cleared, the Phillies had lost a heartbreaker by a score of 15 to 14. It was the most runs scored in a World Series game at the time. And instead of tying the series, the Phillies now had their backs against the wall, down three games to one. At the time, only five teams had ever come back from such a deficit in the World Series. The Phillies had a little more life left in them. In Game 5, Kurt Schilling refused to let Williams blow a good pitching performance. Instead, Schilling pitched a complete game shutout in front of the hometown fans. And then, in Game 6, the Phillies once again gave their fans hope, as they took a one-run lead into the bottom of the ninth inning. But in a story that was all too familiar in that postseason, manager Jim Fergosi chose to go with the arm that had gotten him into the playoffs. As a result, Fragosi paid a price, as Williams again put enough ducks on the pond to let Joe Carter play the role of hero. In the winter of 1993, the Phillies traded Williams to Houston, mercifully sparing him from facing disgruntled Phillies fans at the beginning of the season. It would be another 14 years until the Phillies would once again be in a situation where they could contend for a world championship. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. If you have any ideas for topics that we can cover in the future, please let us know in the comments below. If you would like to see more of these videos, please consider becoming a patron through Patreon. Again, we'll have a link in the description box below.